Hello to one and uh, welcome to this webinar of the AIDS Alliance series on migrant and refugee health, entitled Second Rights in Migration, organized in cooperation with the Centre de Recherche Sociologique et Politique de Paris, CRESPA GTM, and the Health Economics and the HIV AIDS Research Division of the University of uh, Kuala Zulu Natal in South Africa. The center is called HERD. My name is uh, Luciano Sazo, and I'm a vice director of uh, a member of the executive committee of the MH Alliance. Migrant and refugee health has been an important topic for the World Health Summit since 2016, and many sessions were organized at the annual event in Berlin, at regional meetings, at the more specific expert meetings. In this difficult and tragic COVID period, we organize monthly webinars. More information for free registration at all webinars is available at the World Summit page dedicated to migrant and refugee health. For the meeting today, I would like to thank very much uh, Jane Friedman from the Center Crespa GTM, uh, University de Paris uh, 8, and Tamarin Crankshaw from the Center Heard of the University of Kuala Zulu Natal in South Africa. who accepted our invitation, and uh, Professor Stephen Matlin from the Institute of Global Health of Imperial College London, who will be the rapporteur of this meeting. From, for the organization of the webinar, I'd like to thank very much uh, Nora Anton and her collaborators of the World Health Summit team. I would like now to give the screen to Jane uh, Friedman from the CRISPR GDM Center and Tamarina Crankshaw. Jane Friedman is a professor at the University of uh, Paris 8 and co-director of the Center CRISPR. Her research focuses on issues related to gender-based violence, migration, and sexual and reproductive health and rights. She has published widely on these topics and recent books include uh, Gendering, the International Asylum and the Refugee Debate, a gender approach to and uh, she's currently leading a major international research project on uh, sexual and gender-based violence in the context of migration and issues related to uh, also the uh, SRHR immigration. Tamarine Crankshaw is a program leader in uh, sexual and reproductive health rights at the Health Economics it's a Research Division at the same university, KwaZulu uh, Natal in South Africa. Tamarin has a PhD in public health and uh, has a research interest which include uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, prevention of gender-based violence, HIV prevention, and gender politics. Her current research focuses on unsafe abortion, young key populations, co comprehensive sexuality education, and linkages to adolescent-friendly sexual and reproductive health services. She is currently engaged in related projects in the Eastern and Southern Africa region. I would like to thank very much all participants for being online with us today. I'm reading the chat in view of the discussion, which will be open after all presentations. I wish all of you a very pleasant and fruitful meeting. And uh, thanking again, uh, Jane and Tamarin, to you, Jane and Tamarin, the screen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luciano, and thank you to the M8 Alliance for suggesting uh, to Tamarin and I that we could organise this webinar. Um, the theme for the webinar emerges out of research um, that Tamarin and I have been doing both separately and together over recent years, looking um, at issues of sexual and reproductive health, um, especially for young people um, in the, the southern and Eastern African regions, and also looking at issues of migration, forced migration, and the uh, vulnerabilities or insecurities um, it created for migrants in the for migrants and for uh, women um, in particular in the context of migration. And so we've felt um, while doing these research that sexual and reproductive health is really an area um, 
which is often overlooked in the context of migration and forced migration in, in humanitarian contexts, but it poses um, a huge number of problems. And um, what we really, you know, we think that we really need to consider the ways in which the legal, economic um, precarity of migrants and refugees can be combined with uh, gendered inequalities, um, economic and social inequalities, forms of marginalization best based on uh, sexual identity and gender orientation to create really situations where um, individuals become uh, vulnerable and where they have very uh, poor access to, to health services, in particular sexual and reproductive health services. So we can think, for example, about we know that sexual and gender-based violence are huge problems in the context of migration, but what happens to, to people who experience um, this sexual and gender-based violence, can they um, access services? Uh, what about contraceptive services or contraception, access to contraception or abortion um, for, for migrants and refugees? So we think all of these questions haven't been sufficiently considered often in the humanitarian context, which are emergency con contexts, uh, the, the focus is on emergency health responses. And these, um, even though they are vital um, health services, um, uh, they're often not considered um, fully enough, both in research and in uh, health provision. So that's what we, uh, some of the issues that we, that we wanted to talk about, and we are very fortunate um, to have a great panel of four speakers today to, to talk more about different aspects of this. So um, I just want to, before we introduce our speakers, um, just pass the floor over to Tamarin to say a couple of words. Thank you, Jane. Thanks. Um, and I just want to add my voice of welcome to our speakers and to all the colleagues who are uh, joining the webinar today. And just to say that uh, SRHR, it's not only crucial to the aspirations of the SDGs, but on a very fundamental level, it lies at the heart of the health and the well-being of all, and particularly our young people. Um, and those of us who work in the broad field of SRHR uh, are keenly aware of the need to hold what is become increasingly a very contested space for progressing uh, sexual health and rights and reproductive health and rights. And all of this intersects in highly complex um, and dynamic ways. And also that we can't work in the field of SRHR without placing vulnerable and marginalized populations at the very center of our conversations. Uh, so migrants and refugee populations experience SRHR issues in very particular ways uh, that other populations don't. And as you've um, already mentioned, it's in part because of the high uh, levels of the rights violations that they experience, often precipitating uh, their, their migration throughout their journey and then at the end uh, destination. And all of this impacts fundamentally on the SRH. Um, and then also just to point out that even within these populations are highly vulnerable subgroups. Uh, where gender and age makes all the difference and whose SRHR requires much greater attention. So I'd just like to thank Luciano for providing the space to hear our champions of the SRHR uh, amongst migrants and refugees today. Um, they're all um, experts with extensive experience to share. And I really look forward to engaging in discussions with my, uh, my like-minded colleagues um, in how to better address SRHR um, in migration, both nationally and at international level. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. So I think without further ado, we will carry on to uh, listen to our speakers. Just to remind everyone that we're going to listen to all four speakers first and then um, we'll go on to questions and discussion and that you should put your questions in the chat uh, function of this Zoom and Tamarin and I will be reading out your questions at the end. Um, so our first speaker, we're very, very pleased to have uh, Chichi Andi, who's a senior associate in the Reproductive Health Programme at the Population Council's Kenya office. Um, and Chichi is a really a well-known expert um, who has 
done research, published widely, provided strategic and technical oversight um, for the regional SGBV network, um, which is a, a multi-country, uh, a multi-partner, multi-country SGBV uh, response um, uh, network. And I think uh, she, she's worked in the um, East Horn and Great Lakes region of Africa and develop, her research has centered on developing evidence-based responses for different categories of survivors in the region and promoting the utilization of these responses locally, nationally, and regionally. So she's a, a really well-known uh, specialist in this area. We're honored to have you here, Chi Chi. And uh, Chi Chi today is going to be speaking um, about time to go further on coaxing SRHR in migration research out of its comfort zone. So I think this is a perfect introduction to some of the issues that we're going to discuss and why they're important and why perhaps we should look at them in, in a different light. So Chi Chi, if you want to um, open your microphone and camera, the floor is all yours. Thank you um, very much, Jane. Uh, and many thanks to the organizers for inviting me and warm greetings to everyone um, participating in this uh, webinar as well. So my presentation today, um, time to go further on coaxing SRHR in migration research out of its comfort zone is really a conversation starter, which I hope will lead to further discussions on migrant and refugee health. And my goal is to essentially um, open up a can of worms, so to speak, and see where this might lead us. I'm sure I'm not alone in my experience of reading publications and reports on SRHR migration and coming away from them with the sense that we still really don't know as much as we could or should about SRHR in this um, particular context. Our findings are still very tentative and our gaps are still very large and uncertainty seems to be a common refrain. Now, don't get me wrong, research on the subject of SRHR migration is varied, it has spanned decades, yet I don't think we can deny that it has typically focused on small scale, isolated studies, which although representing an important contribution to the evidence base, are unable to lead to definitive statements about the status of SRHR in the context of migration. Indeed, I would argue that it has almost become an expectation that migrants-based research findings will be suggestive rather than conclusive. And so consequently, my impression is that research on SRHR migration is stuck in a comfort zone of sorts. And I, I think there are re good reasons why um, research has been stuck in a rut, so to speak, in this area. Um, the settings in which this research occurs are often accurately referred to as emergency settings, as, as Jane said um, previously. And so they're characterized by all the features that the term emergency connotes. It's challenging and it's impractical um, to do anything more than is typically done in the way of research in such contexts sometimes. However, I think that we, we need to move away from this monolithic construction of what an emergency or refugee setting, for instance, is like. Yes, such contexts can be volatile and can be composed of transient populations. And yes, there are debates around what the average length of stay really is for a refugee outside his or her country. Um, some put it at 20 to 26 years, others put it at five to 10 years. The bottom line though, is that it's often not a short amount of time. And so this means that in some contexts, refugee populations, for instance, and I say refugee populations because that's really where uh, my work is focused. These populations oftentimes are intransient enough to permit meaningful participation in more robust large scale surveys and other kinds of research methodologies that would both nudge us out of our comfort zones and also permit us to begin to build an evidence base that's much more robust and permit us to design even more effective programs as a result. Now, as we know, the well-known global robust surveys um, that we all are aware of and that we all use in aspects of our work totally overlook refugee populations. And so this reinforces the notion that it's simply not possible to carry out, let's say a demographic and health survey or a violence against children survey, for instance, in these contexts. 
However, uh, with support from FCDO over the next five years, the Population Council, which is where I work, the African Population and Health Research Center based here in Kenya, and Well-Made Strategy, also based here in Kenya, um, have come together under a consortium named Baobab to attempt to fill gaps in SRHR among refugees populations in particular um, in the East and Horn of Africa region. And it will do so in several ways, including through moving out of our comfort zones, so to speak, by implementing well-recognized surveys, such as the Violence Against Children Survey, longitudinal surveys on unintended pregnancy, and abortion incident surveys in refugee settings uh, in the region. So Jane, I was really um, happy to see that in your intervention, you mentioned all three of these areas um, as being critical and as being under-researched. I want to emphasize that it would have been impossible to conceptualize such an endeavor without an adequate funding duration. And uh, in my engagement with UN organizations, for instance, and UN implementing partners under the regional GBB um, working group in the East and Southern Africa region, I have learned um, that for implementing partners in refugee settings, a period of 18 months is often seen as a long-term period by donors that focus on these settings. But this is really an insufficient amount of time for building a robust evidence base. It takes time to generate good evidence and it takes time to test good programs. And we could not have a Baobab Research Program Consortium without a realistic program duration, nor without funding to cover such a duration. And we could not have such a consortium without strong partnerships. So in this vein, I want to be sure to mention that the Baobab Consortium has prioritized building partnerships with other experts to ensure that our, our research in refugee settings is the best it can be. In addition to a range of other stakeholders, we've, we have budding co uh, collaborations with experts who are responsible for the actual design of the surveys or the, the design of the original surveys that we plan to conduct. For instance, we're working on an emerging collaboration with Together for Girls and the US Centers for Disease Control on the Violence Against Children Survey in refugee settings. And we're working with the Guttmacher Institute on the uh, abortion incident surveys that we plan to carry out. As much as I believe that we must venture out of our comfort zones in this field, I acknowledge that longer funding periods, more robust funding and strong partnerships between and across program specialists and researchers are essential. However, to begin inching our way out of this zone of comfort, we must first of all acknowledge that we've been comfortable for way too long and begin to desire something different. Now that this kind of worms has been opened, I will leave us with it, trusting that in this sort of emergency situation, all of our expertise, creativity, innovation, and brilliant ideas will kick in, and we'll begin to consider what we can do differently in order to push the envelope and go a bit further in this particular field of research. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chi Chi. I think that's a really interesting and you know vital in opening to just open up some of these questions um, and areas where we do need to go further. So thank you very, very much for your for your very thought provoking um, intervention. And we'll come back. I see there are already some questions, but we'll come back to those later because we're going to move straight on now um, to our next speaker, who is uh, Margit Endler, who is uh, an obst obstetrician and gynecologist and a researcher in the field of global maternal health at uh, in the Department of Women's and Children's Health in the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And um, her main interest is in researching um, on uh, abortion, contraceptive care, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, a very, perhaps a new, what's well, new, quite new for me anyway, but a new area of um, implementing abortion through telemedicine, which um, is a fascinating subject and perhaps something which could be open more widely um, in this field of um, uh, SRH for migrants and refugees. So Margaret, um, the floor is all yours. And if you want to share your screen, thank you very much for joining us. Then it's over to you. Hi, thank you everyone. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to speak to you about uh, under the topic of telemedicine, its potential to improve access to safe abortion for migrant women and women in humanitarian settings. And um, as Titi just said, this was a very good introduction. There's not very much research on 
even the topic of safe abortion and how to perform safe abortion in a humanitarian setting and much less telemedicine. But I do want to speak from a research perspective. So I'll try to speak on how emerging um, evidence from the, particularly from the COVID crisis can inform how we can improve access for, for these women in humanitarian settings. So first of all, um, and this was also apparent in the introduction, how does crisis affect abortion access? Well, we know that when systems fall apart, um, women in, in uh, vulnerable situations, humanitarian settings are the first to suffer. And so what we wanna tie together today is how telemedicine can transcend the, the barriers uh, to abortion for women in humanitarian settings. And we, we can learn from this because we know that there are huge barriers to abortion access also for women who are not in humanitarian settings, but who are in just in settings where abortion is illegal. And that in itself is a type of emergency. So just to go back first to the definition of telemedicine for abortion, the WHO uh, defines uh, telemedicine as uh, the delivery of uh, healthcare services by all healthcare professionals using information and communications technologies for the exchange of valid information for diagnosis, treatment and prevention of disease and injuries. So importantly here, they do include the, that the provider should be a healthcare professional. And this is a, perhaps an important distinction so far and that there should be an exchange of information. So this excludes certain types of unilateral information uh, systems. So when you look at abortion care, telemedicine, so for example, chats or telephone conversations, online consultations, video conferences can be used at all stages of the abortion process. The, the, usually the abortion process involves the counseling the woman, screening her for eligibility from a medical point of view, making a gestational age assessment in terms of safety, what type of abortion she can do, providing her the medication, instructing her how to do the abortion and how what to expect, and guiding her in how to assess abortion completion. And these systems are sometimes used completely in parallel to an existing healthcare system. And sometimes they're used to complement uh, an existing healthcare system. So I'd like to go back first to the question of crisis and, and access and how crisis affects access to abortion. And this is a study that the, the FIGO Committee on um, Human Rights, Refugees and Violence Against Women, which I'm a part of, uh, did measuring the impact of the COVID pandemic on access to abortion across the globe. And what we could see was that most respondents argued that there was less access or much less access across the board. And this was true both in countries which already had severely restricted access and those who had quite mildly restricted access. So um, there was a relative difference in all these countries with less access for many women. But what was interesting in the study was that when we again divided up respondents according to what country they came from in terms of how restricted abortion was, we found that in terms of what the countries had done to mitigate the reduced access was very different. So most countries, 70% of countries which held mild, mildly restrictive abortion laws and policies, they had done something to try and help women access abortion, whereas no country with, with restricted abortion had done so. And the types of policy changes that you could see in these countries was that they've reduced the number of visits that were required for women. They've increased the gestation age limit up to which women could perform abortion at home with medical abortion. Uh, they've made abortion possible at home. Um, they've made it easier to administer the first pill of abortion. Medical abortion is a two-step process uh, where two pills are used um, uh, synergistically because they work together. The first one is usually taken in hospitals, so many countries did away with this first step. And then importantly for this um, lecture, um, introduced telemedicine, so assisted women in various ways. And I want to look particularly at one study that emerged out of a policy change that occurred in the UK at early in the pandemic, in which most of the UK, at least England and Wales, went over to a completely telemedicine-based abortion system. Uh, so this system provided about 80% of all medical abortions to women in these regions after the pandemic became a fact. 
And this means that they can compare outcomes before and after. So what I mean by this is that instead of women coming into the clinic, they were counseled on the phone and you made a risk assessment there. And then they were told to come pick up their medication. They didn't have an ultrasound routinely. So the women that were considered risk were selected and they were asked to come into the hospital for an ultrasound. So these researchers were able to compare the before period, which was almost, uh, which was 22,000 women and the after period, both three months, 22,000 women. And what they first of all concluded was that about 40% were nevertheless called in to do an ultrasound and have a physical exam. But overall rates of complete abortion were very high and not different in, in the groups. Rates of continuing pregnancy were as expected and low in both groups. There were very few serious complications such as hospitalization, blood transfusion, no deaths. Um, ectopic pregnancy rate was also low and similar in both groups. So this is an important paper because research in telemedicine is also fairly new and is also hampered by the fact, just like Chichi said, that it's research that's often been done in emergency type situations, i.e. in countries where abortion is illegal. And this is an example of where you are able to compare uh, different systems in the same country. But importantly, this is done from a high income country with a very solid and extensive backup system. So from my point of view, we are still lacking research from low income settings and, and definitely women in even more vulnerable situations such as a humanitarian setting. So my research group in South Africa where I've lived until recently for several years is doing an RCT in South Africa among a, a low income group of women, 900 women who are randomized either receive standard care, medical abortion care or abortion through telemedicine. So the, the, our telemedicine system consists of an online screening. It's an online questionnaire. It's not a one-on-one -on -one where women are, are screened for eligibility and counseled on family planning and informed. Then they go see a nurse who does do an abdominal palpation. So she makes a rough assessment with her hands of how big the uterus is and what, how far the woman is. Then she receives instructions for the abortion um, through Facebook Messenger and several text messages. And she picks up the medication at the clinic and does the abortion at home. So this study is ongoing. We've recruited about 730 women. And I hope to be able to see that this is a workable model because this is a model that I hope can apply to other African countries and also settings where abortion is illegal, where women can piece together their own abortion by consulting a physician or a nurse online, acquiring the medication, perhaps going to, see, going to see a nurse without divulging the fact that she needs an abortion just to get help with an assessment of how far she is in the pregnancy. And, but what could this look like for women in humanitarian settings? Well, I think that all these components could form part of a system, just as I said. Women could access a clinic online and be screened and guided. And then she could seek her own gestational age assessment if it seems that she needs one. What I do see in my study from the South African context is that there is more uncertainty about gestational age. Um, and some women think that they know their gestational age, but are they're wrong by a, a higher margin of error than it seemed to be in the UK study. But already misoprostol, which is a commonly used drug, has a wide distribution. And I can think of several systems from pharmacies to pick up points in which to distribute medication. Um, but importantly for abortion care, there has to be some kind of backup emergency services because though complications are rare, they can be serious. And abortion is one of the most common interventions performed by women. So many, many women perform abortions every year. This I borrowed from IPAS. I know IPAS is here, so I hope they'll forgive me. Uh, this is the kind of pictorial that women can use um, uh, in addition to online guidance. Once she has the pills in her hands, it's quite easy to instruct. And I also find from my study that women have a high ability to understand written instructions online and through chats, messages, and they do take the pills correctly. That's something that we measure in our study. So in sum, about telemedicine, uh, I do think that it's a part of the trend towards increased self-management in abortion care that we are seeing on a global scale. 
and it is an opportunity to circumvent logistical and legal barriers faced by women in humanitarian settings. But we must be um, we must meet the particular needs and mitigate the risks that are inherited in these settings um, with a very vulnerable population and vulnerable subgroups such as young women. Um, and in what I think is also very important once these systems become online and, and global, there are advantages to that, but we mustn't absolve governments from recognizing that this is an essential component of sexual reproductive health and rights and that they should take responsibility also for the migrant and refugee women um, in their countries. Thank you, that was all from me. Thank you very much indeed, Margit. And it seems a, a really interesting way of thinking about um, going forwards and in humanitarian and emergency settings, how this could be used. But as you said, I think really not to also emphasize the, the responsibilities of governments and um, for assuring the, these rights for all women um, within, their, within their countries, but really fascinating. So thank you. Um, and now, well, you talked about uh, EPAS uh, in your um, in your presentation. So now uh, this is probably a very good um, follow on that we're going to have. Uh, our next speaker is Tamara Fessers, who is um, currently the senior research lead um, for research development and implementation efforts in humanitarian settings at EPAS. Uh, Tamara holds a master's degree in public health from the University of California at Los Angeles. Um, and her professional interests include program and policy evaluation, maximizing research impact, measurement of abortion morbidity and mortality, participatory learning and action research, and human-centered design and sexual and rep reproductive health for refugees. And she's co-authored many uh, articles um, and so we're delighted to have her here um, to talk about safe abortion care in humanitarian settings, problems and potential. So Tamara, uh, the floor is all yours. I think you need to put your microphone on Tamara, sorry. How about now? Yes. Thank you, Jane. And thanks to the M8 Alliance. And Margaret, you are absolutely forgiven and also thanked for sharing our materials. We love it. That's what they're there for. It's really great to see they're not sitting just on a computer somewhere. Um, so thanks again. And I'm very happy to be here. I am, as Jane said, a senior researcher uh, at IPES. I've had the privilege of much of my career spending it studying abortion care, both the, the quantity, quality, availability, and innovations around it. Um, and for the last few years, I have been very happy to share, have my passion and my interests collide and be looking at um, abortion in humanitarian settings. So I'm going to speak briefly about two decades of advocacy resulting in some great progress and also continued barriers and things I see as very promising trends in improving abortion care uh, access and research uh, in uh, humanitarian settings. So I promised to discuss some of the unique problems faced by people trying to access a safe uh, and legal and sometimes extra legal abortion in humanitarian settings. As uh, our previous speakers have already said, displacement is uh, currently at the highest in history. Almost 1% of humans are now in displacement and uh, we are spending far longer in displacement. But that statistic is a soundbite that we use all the time. Imagine that is one half of a woman's reproductive life. And evidence shows in these settings, the little evidence we have that women and girls face severe challenges accessing sexual and reproductive health and services and abortion care in general. So many factors contribute to that, like social and cultural stigma related to sex, language and cultural differences, unintended pregnancy, unsafe abortions, uh, a lack of access to safe abortion, uh, poor knowledge of uh, sexual and reproductive health services, particularly in uh, host communities and restrictive laws and policies. 
Now, just a few words, because I feel I must, about the need for evidence uh, on abortion care in humanitarian settings. Evidence drives our knowledge base and our efforts to correct this human rights violation. But studying abortion care in humanitarian settings is like studying air. It's like studying air or maybe studying air if you're not an air quality scientist, as I am not. It is studying the absence of something and making connections with other topics, uh, research and context. So there are numerous evidence reviews that show this and show that health interventions in humanitarian sites have found a dearth of research in, in these settings. What little there is was not rigorous enough and did not address abortion. And the rigor issue, Chi I think, described very, very well that problem that we're having in her first talk. Um, a review of, of uh, proposals submitted to donors found that less than that very few had information on sexual and reproductive health, requested funding for that, and uh, none um, requested funding to study abortion or even PAC. But even as this climate is changing a lot in the past five years that I've seen, um, and research has become more tolerant, abortion in a humanitarian setting still remains understudied. Um, and many practitioner and research institutions lack the interests, the networks and skills to conduct this challenging research in these complex environments. Topic um, Chi Chi already spoke uh, pretty extensively about. But what do we know about why it's important? We know a lot about sexual violence and displacement. Um, some of it, again, making those connections with other contexts and other, other research, but at all stages of conflict. Um, and displacement, people are at risk of violence, including sexual violence, exploitation, and transactional sex. We have every reason to believe that unintended pregnancy and unsafe abortion uh, are common in these settings, and the demand for this service in the few places where it's available uh, is undeniable. Uh, the individual study estimates of sexual violence and exposure to, to it in uh, humanitarian settings has a very wide range. It, it can go from as little as 1% of the study population reporting exposure to violence, either IPV or um, non-partner related sexual violence, to as much as almost three quarters of the study population reporting exposure to violence. If you care to know more about uh, one of the reasons why I think that people don't study uh, abortion in humanitarian settings or did not was this contention that abortion is illegal in humanitarian settings. But the Center for Reproductive Rights maintains this online resource and interactive map that you might like to explore if you have more interest in this topic. Only six countries ban abortion entirely. And as reflected on this slide, 99% of the world's population lives in a country where safe abortion is permitted under some circumstances. There are also a number of international and regional agreements, such as those uh, I put on the slide, that support the imperative to provide safe abortion in crisis settings, regardless of a person's statehood. The Muputo Protocol is has grown in importance in the last five years since it's um, initiation. Uh, it is, this is a regional treaty on women's rights that directs states to legalize abortion where, when necessary to protect a woman's physical and mental health, as well as in cases of rape, incest, and fetal anomaly. Many countries like the DRC are signatories to the protocol. And in March 2018, in a very uh, monumental move in this field, the government of the DRC published the protocol in their nation's legal gazette and officially entered that treaty into force, changing their law from one of the most restrictive in the world to one that allows abortion in a wide variety of conditions. Of course, there's a big difference between laws and access. And one of those differences and one of those problems is really the United States. Um, there's the problem of US laws and policies that restrict funding, silence advocates, and prohibit progress, including research in the field of research and uh, limiting research funding for this topic. As the largest global health donor in the world, US policies do have an impact. And I'm not talking only about the Mexico City policy or the global gag rule that Joe Biden ended in his presidency that, uh, that 
that restricts funding for NGOs that provide abortion counseling, referrals, or advocacy. But I'm also talking about a more insidious and pervasive influence of the 1973 Helms Amendment passed by US Congress after Roe v. Wade was, uh, was put into law by the US Supreme Court um, that limits the use of foreign assistance funds for abortion, including for research. American global health funding programs such as USAID currently overinterpret the Helms Amendment language to exclude funding for abortion services not connected to family planning, such as rape, incest, or to save the life of the woman. For a great read on the impact of the US foreign uh, foreign assistance on abortion in humanitarian settings. I highly recommend this article that came out yesterday by Jill Filipovich in the New York Review of Books. So all that being said, I am an idealist at heart. And in spite of all these challenges I've mentioned, uh, the road ahead looks far more promising to me. As an example, I have this uh, photograph showing the annual IWAG meeting that I'll describe in a minute held in Senegal in 2017. Participants were asked to hold up colored slides and although they all look yellow here, they actually are all green. There were 130 participants at this meeting, roughly 60 agencies from around the world, including UN and donor agencies, and uh, they're expressing their response to the question here on slides about uh, our responsibility to offer safe abortion care. Uh, the core of the support comes from a group called the Interagency Working Group for Reproductive Health in Crisis. It's a broad-based, highly collaborative coalition um, reflecting, representing UN governmental donor and research organizations. It's formed in 1995, has more than 2,500 members, and I've heard it called at UN meetings one of the most successful uh, volunteer coalitions in the world. They have supported safe abortion in several ways by supporting and hosting a, a sub working group on abortion um, and uh, by making more public their support and advocacy. But moving from this support and giving like organizations a platform and a group and an umbrella for which to talk about the how we do this in a safe space. But moving from that express support um, to action has still proven to be hard. Um, for those of you who might not know the Interagency Working Group, um, there are some resources that can be useful and helpful. Um, here you can find on the website um, guiding principles and 10 steps um, that can be used for advocacy for safe abortion, both internally uh, within an organization and externally with partners. We often work with donors to uh, um, uh, educate and offer facilitation uh, on these tools. On the right side of the screen, you see the revised edition of the interagency field manual, which is really the guide for implementation on sexual and reproductive health in humanitarian settings. And in 2018, it was published with expanded language emphasis and guidance on safe abortion care in humanitarian settings, which was a huge um, effort uh, and signed on to by more than 50 organizations, including UN organizations backing this, this uh, field manual. Of course, abortion technologies may be the easier part of all of this. We now have excellent technologies that are affordable, effective, with abundant evidence, um, some of which Margaret has described earlier, offering that it's, a, that it's a effective in low resource settings and at the primary care level, and now even by telemedicine. MVA and misoprostol are currently available in reproductive health kits that are sent out to in humanitarian settings to organizations providing and implementing health services. Uh, and most recently, uh, last year, we had a very big win that mifepristone is the gold standard medical abortion medication now available through UNFPA uh, is available to be ordered through these prepackaged kits so it can be prepositioned and ordered by NGOs providing health services. However, it can only be sent to locations where it's registered and legal, which is really less than 50 countries in the world. Uh, what I I think another great stride we've made in the past several years is really our strongest example of success uh, in Bangladesh, in a country with uh, 
essentially legal abortion called menstrual regulation. Uh, abortion was introduced there in the acute phase, phase of emergency and then scaled up and expanded to increase access for nearly a million Rohingya refugees residing in Bangladesh. To date, providers there have provided almost 30,000 abortion procedures, nearly 75 of which were safe and legal terminations. Most of these were with medication and all in partnership with the government and humanitarian organizations and UN organizations working in that country. So we now know that it is possible and that the sky won't fall essentially if we provide this care. One of the biggest and most exciting opportunities I think is really being led by people themselves, people taking action, um, and making their own choices. There are now a vast number of resources available for self-care, including abortion self-care and contraceptive, contraceptive self-care. WHO is leading, uh, providing leadership on this initiative. And people now have access to their own abortion uh, can, and can make their own choices with medication safely, privately, and on their own. This uh, is an opportunity even beyond telehealth and telemedicine that can, we could make available in humanitarian settings to really greatly expand uh, and make a difference in people's lives. But how can we reach people with relevant information they can absorb and use when they need it, as and when they need it? The global pandemic has really challenged us with that question and humanity I think has really stepped up. On this slide you see a number of different resources both digital and in person that we think can help to fill that gap and make reliable evidence-based information available to people in all over the world but particularly in humanitarian settings as we begin to continue to make to chip away and make strides at closing uh, the digital divide. Of course, legal risk is ever present for those who work on abortion, regardless of the law. This is particularly, and we see persecution uh, in places even where the law or guidance permits abortion in circumstances. But it's particularly important as we move towards medical abortion outside of the health facility. In response, IPAS and the Center for Reproductive Rights have created this facilitation guide that we call the legal risk tool to help individuals, NGOs, and other organizations examine and mitigate their legal risks, risks relate, sorry, related to abortion laws and policies. So in sum, I really think there has been a groundswell of interest and enthusiasm in this area. Uh, the number of webinars I've seen alone in the last year uh, and attended and presented at have has been enormous and we have many more partners and collaborators of all types, even those receiving US government assistance speaking out um, about the, the human rights imperative of providing safe abortion care um, in humanitarian settings. The innovations are plentiful. The integration of safe abortion care for survivors of sexual violence uh, is beginning to gain more traction and Chi Chi herself has done some great work in this area. There is a growing body of research with more participation and local ownership, um, providing a wider range of voices. The self-care movement is uh, beginning to help organizations begin to say that if they can't provide uh, abortion care in a facility, they will help make sure women and men and people have these choices outside of a health facility. And there is a growing interest in collaboration with a wider range of partners. partners. What is clear and urgent though is, is the need for more research to guide this work, including to continue to generate interest, to document the scope of the problem, uh, to test and evaluate the impact of different models of care, and also information sharing that we're now uh, importantly working on. And most importantly, to better understand women's and girls', girls needs and perspectives. Unsafe abortion is a problem that affects women globally. However, women in humanitarian and fragile settings are even more vulnerable, and we have a responsibility to ensure their rights are, are realized. Uh, more research is definitely in progress, particularly on PAC, but more is urgently needed to address the knowledge gap, as well as provide evidence for the claim that we are making a difference. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Tamara. And I think that was a great um, follow on from uh, Margit's paper and, and uh, Shi Chi's introduction. And it's good that you um, seem to give some optimistic um, points of view and, and ways forward. So I think that's, um, it was uh, very heartening. Thank you. Um, and we're just, before we go to the questions, uh, we're going to go to our final, last but not least, our final speaker, who is Shirin Hidari, who's a senior researcher at the Global Health Center and a research affiliate of the Gender Center at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. Um, and she, Shirin is also the principal investigator of a multi-country research project on transnational sex and the sexual and reproductive health repercussions in forced displacement. And today she's going to talk about this. She's going to talk about transactional sex in forced migration and the sexual and reproductive health repercussions of that. So uh, over to you, Shirin. Great, thank you so much, Jane. And I will follow on the theme of the need for more research and specifically on the sexual and reproductive health. And again, as Jane mentioned, this is the ongoing research. So uh, I'm probably, we're gonna raise more questions than providing any answers or data at this point, but I hope that the, the, the presentation will actually provoke some conversations around this topic. Uh, so again, we. Everybody has mentioned that investment in research on sexual and reproductive health is actually very limited, but the literature on transactional sex among refugees and migrants is even more discussed. So I wanna give you a little bit of a background about how we came about this research. So a few years ago, together with my colleague, Dr. Monica Onyango, we put together this special issue on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of displaced populations. And uh, again, in addition to all the other gaps that exist with respect to uh, research, uh, SRHR research in these settings, we noticed the particular paucity of data and limited research on sex work in humanitarian and forced displacement contexts. And around the same time, there were also a couple of media uh, stories that got uh, quite much coverage. So one was around uh, uh, women engaging in transactional sex in the post-earthquake Haiti, uh, engaging with peacekeeping, uh, peacekeepers and aid workers. The media stories often portrayed the really extreme poverty and desperation of these women, the lack of shelter, food, uh, childcare, uh, you know, necessity items, and also highlighting the gender imbalance and the power imbalance between uh, the women and of course the peace, the male peacekeepers and aid workers and you know contextualizing that as these men were exploiting the socioeconomic vulnerability of these women and presenting it as sexual exploitation and abuse and just to kind of highlight that in the terminology related to sexual exploitation and abuse uh, abuse um, in the context of the U United Nations transactional sex and solicitation of transactional sex is explicitly included. Uh, at the same time, there was another um, sorry um, story coming out, uh, actually a documentary around transactional sex by uh, young uh, men in Athens and some other stories that looked at this from a different lens. These stories often um, covered refugees, uh, both male and females, not in a post-emergency or emergency context, but mostly in uh, forced displacement settings in European countries or in middle-income countries such as Lebanon, Turkey, or Jordan. And again, highlighting their precarious situation and vulnerability, lack of food, housing, shelter, and income, but framing it differently, framing it as a survival sex or that the refugees were resorting to prostitutions, even in cases where UN officials were caught on camera as potential clients purchasing sexual services from young men. And these, these two different kind of angles to transactional sex in humanitarian and forced displacement context really compelled us to examine how transactional sex is defined and conceptualized and considered in the context, in this context, and also, you know, what do we know about the health implications, in particular, sexual and reproductive health implications. 
We were familiar with the, the literature on transactional sex uh, from the HIV field. And just to do a recap that in that literature, transactional sex it came, came about in the field of HIV in the 1990s, mostly uh, with the focus of looking at uh, prevention of HIV through these transactional relations in Sub-Saharan Africa and describing transactional sex and when uh, mostly adults and young adults engage in uh, often consensual sensual sexual activities, either regularly or occasionally, in exchange for cash, goods, services, or benefits. The focus in this literature is mainly on intergenerational relationship, often between younger women and older men, as a driver of HIV. And Transactional sex in this context is often distinguished from sex work and also from sexual exploitation and abuse. And the motivations are described not only to meet basic needs, but also for purchasing consumer goods, uh, improving social status or gaining other social benefits, and even seeing as exchange of these uh, goods as a material expression of love within a relationship in the broader um, context where there is a gender assumption that men are providers. But when we started looking at uh, transactional sex in, in forced display, in our preliminary research uh, in Amman, Beirut, Athens, and Istanbul in 2018, we soon realized that transactional sex uh, in displacement settings is much more complex and it also has much more wide ranging motivations and implications. Many refugees uh, engage in transactional sex for a variety of reasons, uh, to meet their basic needs, to send money back to their families, to pay smugglers, to continue their journey in exchange uh, for protection, actually, from sexual violence from others, either throughout their migration journey or in camps, to cross borders, uh, or simply as a better option among limited options that they have. And it's not only women that engage in transactional sex, it's also men, uh, both straight identifying and gay identifying, as well as transgender people. As one of our uh, interviews in Athens even mentioned, that's many refugee men sees that as a refugee job. But the boundaries between these different categories uh, in forced displacement is actually much more blurred. Uh, and you can see that transactional sex is used very inconsistently as applied to a vast range of practices that can really vary in both motivation and meaning. It can be sometimes referred to as sex work or prostitution or survival sex. Other times it can be referred to as sexual exploitation and even sexual violence. And it's sometimes even uh, conflated with trafficking. And this confusion is very problematic because depending on the terms used, the humanitarian and political actors, of course, may address this issue in different ways, but in most cases, it just results in an inability to act in any ways or to improve the protection uh, of the persons involved or better meet their health needs. Uh, and the literature on transactional sex, again, offers a very narrow interpretation of the motivation of transactional sex. It fails to examine transactional sex not only as a strategy for survival, but also perhaps a strategy for mobility, better livelihood, or other aspiration. And also, while the, the term it, itself is quite gender neutral, it really hides uh, a number of persistent gender uh, uh, assumptions around vulnerability, agency, and consent. And which has resulted in a pure focus on women, uh, often as victims, and an exclusion of looking at the practice among men and uh, people of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity. And again, uh, there is a failure also to examine agency in this context. The literature really uh, has created these two extremes of where refugees are either utterly powerless or they're in full control and thereby they're sex workers or they're victims. And the presence or absence of just one choice as statics and not something that is actually dynamic and might change really fails to uh, recognize that vulnerability and agency can actually coexist and they're not mutually exclusive. Um, and you know that transactional sex sometimes can be a choice among very limited options because it's better pay, it might offer more control over hours, offer more flexibility, in particular if there are women who have childcare responsibility and might be limited on that. And it's not always a less safe uh, less safer option than other jobs. There are a number of stories about refugee engages in, in, in informal jobs where they're kind of working in really appalling conditions and also subject to sexual harassment and abuse. 
there's also a limitation in the literature. Uh, so, you know, so I think what, what is important to really also understand that even the, the issue of agency and vulnerability in this setting is actually quite complex and multidimensional. And there is also a limitation in the literature to also look at the structural and policy factors that facilitate um, transactional sex. Many factors that transactional sex is actually a result of political decisions and migration and other policies. Humanitarian uh, and aid and care system themselves play an important role in, in the way that they create, reinforce gender hierarchies and produce and reproduce gender notions of vulnerability, threats, who is in, who is in need of protection and all of these of course shapes refugees condition and trajectories and can reproduce new new forms of vulnerability which further can um, facilitate entry in transactional sex or also uh, exacerbate the implications in terms of sexual and reproductive health as well as mental health but most importantly, the lack of research into understanding both the causes and also the sexual and reproductive health implications of transactional sex results in a, a, a lot of um, humanitarian actors feeling paralyzed and don't know what to do. And this is a quote for a provider in Delhi that says, everybody knows it's happening. We just don't know what to do about it. What can we be mindful of? How can we approach it? How should we talk about it? This we don't really know. And that's exactly the same sentiment we got when we were interviewing stakeholders in these four countries that there is a lack of understanding of what people can do. There's a frustration in uh, people's professional capacity over, the, over a lack of clear conceptualization of these terms uh, and also a lack of policy guidance that uh, renders them really incapable of providing uh, services and responding effectively. But we know also from past literature uh, that uh, there are important sexual and reproductive health implications of transactional sex. Uh, for first, one that is clearly established is of course the increased risk of HIV and sexually transmitted infections, but also there is an increased risk of sexual and gender-based violence, uh, unintended pregnancies and other sexual and reproductive health uh, repercussions that uh, might not be captured adequately if we don't understand. And there's a lot of stigma and taboo around transactional sex, which of course further creates barriers into accessing services. And there are also legal, legal barriers. In many settings, uh, there are uh, pure punitive laws around sex work or same-sex practices. There are also physical and um, sexual violence from clients, police officers, community, even host community sex workers that makes the disclosure about such practices even more difficult as well as access to um, vital information and free services that is necessary for their health and well-being. So overall, uh, again, uh, as we are embarking on this research project, and we are also confident that, you know, unfortunately, the COVID pandemic will have exacerbated a lot of these conditions, we really need to have a much more nuanced understanding of the complexities of transactional sex and the sexual and reproductive health implications across the migration's journey, understanding both the socioeconomic factors as well as the structural and policy factors, the legal factors, and also revisiting and maybe challenging the narrow conceptualization and the confusion in terms in the terminology and the guidance that exists with regard to transactional sex in displacement and humanitarian settings uh, and hopefully that will guide uh, the you know developing tailored policies and also ensuring that there is tailored intervention that can really protect people who engage in transactional sex as well as meet their specific needs with respect to sexual and reproductive health and I end there and I'm sure we will have lots to talk about thank you so much Thank you so much, Shirin. And yes, I'm sure that gives us lots and lots to talk about. And I think um, it's great because all four speakers have really touched on in a different way, but some core issues to do with the lack of research and lack of data, um, the need to redefine or define our terms, the problems with legal constraints, but also economic and political. So I think there are loads of questions and lots of discussions. We already have some questions in the, in the discussion. Um, so I'll start by reading out some of those. If everyone could, um, all the panelists, you could put your cameras back on now, that would be great. Um, and we'll go for some of the questions. Unfortunately, I just have to say, unfortunately, Margit uh, had to leave early. 
but she's left in the chat her email address if anyone wanted to contact her. But for the, all the rest of um, the rest of the panel are still here. So for the audience, please do carry on putting your questions into the chat. Um, I'll start with a question from Ursula Trummer. I hope you am pronouncing your name right, who says that um, I agree that we need better evidence in the field. However, on the basis of what is known so far, how can we create a tension that has an impact on funding sources as a prerequisite for doing good and appropriate studies? And how can we create relevance on policy level for the topic? So I think um, for all of us researchers, um, that's clearly clearly a, a key point. How do we get the funding? And on a policy level, how do we make sure that this topic, these topics are relevant and are on the agenda? So I think that's addressed to all of the panel members. So I don't know if it, any of you would like to start or who would like to start on that? I, I can jump in, Jane, if, if that's Thank okay. Yeah, that's I mean, great. I think, thanks uh, Ursula for that uh, comment. I, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I think we have a lot of uh, different possibilities for solutions that we just may not be harnessing uh, properly. I mean, this webinar is one way of doing that. And we just have to use the wheels that we have strategically. Uh, I'm not sure how many donors are were strategically targeted to attend this webinar, for instance. It could have been a perfect um, platform um, for you know, donors who are funding in this area to really hear um, our perspectives on you know, what really needs to happen. Um, and there are other ways, you know, such as that. I mean, Shirin talked about the special issue she and Monica you know, put together, you know, doing those kinds of things, targeted activities and ensuring that they get into the hands um, of the right people, I think are, are some ways in which that can be done. Um, and these are, are strategies that have been used really successfully. I think that we just need to maybe um, have a tighter network with a tighter purpose for ensuring that, you know, this message gets to where it needs to go. Thanks. Do um, Shirin or Tamara, do you have anything to add to that? Anything you? I can, I can add, no, I think you're absolutely right that sometimes we actually have enough evidence of what works, but we also have to recognize that sexual and reproductive health field is a highly politicized arena as well, that sometimes it's actually disregarding what evidence exists. It's just a lack of investment because of the political nature of it. And I think that might need additional kind of channels for advocacy or highlighting the issue to make sure that we can get more resources, both for creating more evidence that can tailor policy and program responses, but also making sure that the evidence is used in an appropriate manner. I would agree with both Shirin and Chichi. I think as a research community, we probably have more ideas than we have funding opportunities. And we need to work both ends of that spectrum by creating more funding opportunities, more interest amongst donors and even uh, and country bilateral and multilateral donors who may not have paid as much attention to this topic in the past. And uh, I think there's a lot of room for innovation. Creative, innovative work needs to be replicated. And it just because it works in Uganda or Iowa, does not mean it's going to work in humanitarian contexts. And uh, I found Shirin's topic very fascinating and informative. And that kind of creative, thoughtful uh, research will go a long way to continue to create opportunities um, in, in the area of sex and sexual exploitation, sexual behaviors, as well as general sexual and reproductive research. Yes, so thank you. So we need to be creative as well and think it's not just wait for the funders to come to us, but to be creative in the way we're thinking and presenting these questions. Um, there's a question here which was addressed to Margaret, but I think actually um, perhaps Tamara, you, you talked a bit about your legal guidance and the question was about the hope that telemedicine could be implemented in countries with restrictive abortion laws. Um, but how could that be done without substantial risks for the providers and recipients? Um, so perhaps you could say a little bit more about uh, your legal guidance and what you would think on how 
using this kind of telemedicine, how can it be done without putting people at risk who are in the countries? I think um, that's an excellent question. I don't pretend to have all the answers, but as researchers, I think we have great opportunity and resources available to us. Um, all of our research and our research protocols go through extensive review at protections, which might not be the case for organizations that are just introducing something on their own. Um, we have to go through IRBs and ethics committees that ensure that we are taking the greatest protection uh, of people who are involved in our studies. And, and we, I think as researchers, we're all trained and committed to do that. Um, the use of information, um, the availability of information, the availability, of, there's so much information out there that is um, uh, oppositional, that is untrue, that is, is based in myth. Uh, and by providing more evidence-based information that is contextualized and useful to people, that is the first step towards power and action and engagement. And it can go a very long way. I know that there are many behavior change scientists who are going to be like, eh, it doesn't make action. And giving condoms doesn't mean people are going to use them. But it is the, the necessary first step in, in that path. And there is nothing illegal anywhere about providing that information. So I think there's a lot we can do to build upon that and, um, and looking at the channels and methods for which that information is provided and then studying how people use it on their own um, and making those networks and those things as closed and as confidential and as private and safe as possible. Because if we don't do that and act upon that, people are going to do it anyway. And they're going to do it with not the right information and resources available to them. So they need to know, and particularly in abortion care, how to have uh, an abortion safely. And then they need to know where to go if they don't have that abortion safely. And there's nothing illegal about that. So if Jane, if I may jump in, um, in the early HIV response, when they were interested in the, the use of cell phones and adherence to ARVs, there was a lot of research. That, and um, we did some research around um, looking at adherence among cell phones and particularly looking at the gendered patterns of cell phone use. So we found that women often shared with family members their cell phone, often shared with their children. Um, and also uh, what we've learned with our COVID research is data issues, of course. That's, that's going to be a huge, certainly in the LMIC settings, data is, is, is going to be a serious um, constraint in the use um, of, of cell phones and distribution of information. But I did, I did find myself wondering about the patterns of cell phone use um, um, Certainly, um, in the South African context with Margaret's study, but this is more this is a broader application that, in the research that we do, maybe one of the first steps is to understand how people use their cell phones and, and how their cell phones gets it gets moved around between families, groups, partners. You know, especially thinking that abortion is probably a very controversial topic within the family. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. I think those are excellent points, but it shouldn't stop us from making information available and making our information as safe as possible. Uh, we have expanded a lot of our telehealth programs uh, across the globe during this past year at IPAS, and um, some of them involve intermediaries and community networks uh, and are really just referral pushes out to, uh, to human engagement or referral into a facility. Some of them are a closed loop for providing all the information you would need. We still have a problem with connecting people with medications. That's a, an outstanding problem, I think, in the field. But we also recently created a chat bot on WhatsApp. Uh, we did a lot of user-centered design around what that should look like, what it should be called people. Do they want a persona that's a peer or a, uh, a more technical expert? And then we made sure that uh, people know right up front that if they want to uh, eliminate any um, 
any track tracking or any trail of the message that they can delete it upfront and no one would be able to see that they actually contacted that chatbot. So things like protections like that are becoming more and more common and available and demanded. And we, part of it is a technology issue and part of it is ethics issue and keeping up with that. I know the Hesperian Health Guides who have introduced a safe abortion mobile app widely uh, around the globe. They did that in response because so many people were coming to their website and looking up abortion information all the time. So they, it's now available, I think, 10 languages. It continues to be the most popular thing that people search for on the web and uh, a popular uh, downloadable mobile application. People demanded that they take the word abortion out of the title, and they did that, and they made it uh, a more uh, generic sort of reproductive health looking thing. And those kind of things are still possible. Many more innovations than that, that I don't know about. But if I may add, and, and, I, and I think these, these are really exciting uh, initiatives, uh, Tamara, but I also think there's specifically in the kind of refugee kind of, there's also a gender dimensions. I think as Tamari mentioned, there is also uh, this gender gap in terms of both access to mobile, the usage of it, the digital literacy, uh, the kind of the knowledge of really how to remove that digital trace to ensure kind of safety and security. And again, I'm also very curious, we were exploring potential digital uh, Kind of research, remote research in the context of COVID, but we kind of really came across all of these ethical and safety concerns because of this gender divide in access to mobile phones, specifically in the refugee populations. I'd love to hear you know any advice on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that was something that I was going to pick up on too, because in, it seems to be often in you know refugees in transit or in in situations where we've been working with them, uh, the men have, you know, and there's still a paradigm of treating like family migration and so where men, you know, as head of families have more access and uh, have more control and access to telephone. So that really getting the information to, um, to the, to women. And specifically, there was a question also, which perhaps links in, you know, about young women and, you know, young women who are often the most marginalized. So how to get them to get access to phones or to, to this kind of information, I think is could be a key point. I don't know if anyone uh, has anything to... And that was the you know, question, which um, perhaps we could bring in too, because I think that really is relevant here, but about the differences between adolescents and adults, because I mean, adolescents even more, you know, dependent on having often like parental consent or someone's consent for accessing these kind of uh, sexual and reproductive health care. So how does that impact as well? And in refugee or migration settings? It is certainly not a one size fits all solution. And <laughs> I was hoping that somebody else had some really the great answer to that very important question. But uh, I, I mean, the the largest the biggest problems we faced were um in bangladesh really where the rohingya language is is relatively new and is completely different even for bangladeshis so it was a very difficult situation there where digital options were really not possible except uh i think there has been one or there are now a couple of tools developed for community health workers to actually help them bridge the language gap uh, with Rohingya refugees. But you might not have noticed in um, my slides in one of the tools was a game that we created called Kelly Kelly Shiki, which was about couples decision making and helping men be more involved and be a part of reproductive decision making. Um, there's, there's, you know, as, as people move towards more and more and longer stays in camps and outside of camps and displacement, I think that more and more people, uh, women and men are getting access to cellular phones, data and communications. I think that it's grown even in the past year phenomenally. I think that WhatsApp is doing uh, as much as they can to fill that gap by being a a low and no cost service with very limited uh, 
data and uh, connectivity um, available. There's SMS um, programs are also offering some potential and new uh, applications like Telegram or Telegraph are offering new uh, and more protections even than WhatsApp, certainly uh, than Facebook. But uh, I think it's an excellent question and it, it may be that the interventions, some of the interventions that we are introducing are really just too risky and too specific and not appropriate for some populations to have a digital option. Okay, does anyone else want to come in here or do we have any other questions from the audience? Please feel free anyone to join in or to type your question if you have anything else to add. So I wanted to, um, if there's no other audience questions, I'm going to take, uh, take up my uh, privileges chair here. Um, I was uh, just coming back to what Shireen was talking about, about this uh, whole problem of transactional, well, perhaps we should call it transactional sex or sex work or sexual economic exchange. Um, but how, um, I don't know, asking whether Tamara and Chi Chi, have you come across this as a problem in, in the areas where you're working and the fact that, you know, people for various different reasons engage in these kind of transactional sexual activity and uh, it can be stigmatizing, they can not be accessing reproductive, uh, sexual reproductive health because of uh, legal or discriminate, legal restrictions or discriminations linked to that kind of um, sexual activity. Well, I can say that I know, um, uh, you know, transactional sex is um, a priority of UNHCR, um, which is uh, the organization that we've been working in um, regionally. Um, it's, um, you know, really um, an issue that they are trying to figure out how to target. Um, and it's something that they prioritize. Um, although I have not, you know, um, worked on this specific, this specific issue directly, you know, with an actual population. Um, I have thought quite a bit about it theoretically. And, you know, I agree that it is, you know, a fascinating issue. I think that it's also a very complex issue, especially in societies where almost everything is transactional, so to speak. Um, and I, I'm not sure if any society is exempt. So I think, you know, that's where I kind of struggle with the concept of transactional um, sex, um, sort of trying to figure out, well, what isn't transactional? And I guess the big thing about transactional sex is the SRHR issues that it can lead to and so on and so forth. But um, just to say, and this doesn't help really respond to your question, Jane, but it's a concept that I struggle with because um, it's just so complex and it's just, um, easy to use that label for certain people without realizing that in many ways we're all operating transactionally all the time, you know? Anyway, so I just thought I'd throw that out there and say it's a priority for the key organizations. And so I'm so glad that Shirin is doing this uh, piece of work because we need to know more about it. We need to fully unpack it. Thanks. And we are doing it together with Jane and we definitely welcome all your intellectual and any other contribution you can make because I agree it is a very complex uh, issue so. Same goes for me. My experience is very limited and I cannot wait till you publish those papers and start a huge global movement. Um, but, um, and to force everyone's hands and to make change. Um, really, I have very limited uh, experience and mostly comes from adolescent sexual and reproductive health where uh, in, in development contexts more than humanitarian contexts where there's obviously a lot of um, transactional sex that happens amongst uh, young women primarily. But I was curious, like, now that you've embarked on this topic and this theme, uh, is it, would you advise researchers to go forward looking at this broad topic or to focus on a more narrow aspect of uh, 
of as you call it, the term, even the terminology is so broad. Like sex work is not really what you're talking about anymore. Sexploitation. And do, is it better for us to look at a context and to look at the, the lives and the situation of both men, women, boys, and girls? Or do we focus on one gender and their experiences to create something that is that might come out with interventions um, that are more specific to that community? These are excellent questions, Tamara. I don't know if I've answered to that. So I welcome Jane to also chip in. But well, I really think that there is so much confusion and conflation about the terms that it's very difficult to say that you will focus on one because they're so overlapping, specifically when it comes to look at it. Again, I think it is a slightly different in development context, but in displacement context, again, there's so much confusion. I think there is really a, a spectrum of these uh, sexual transactions that Again, the level of coercion, exploitation to agency is, is really a gray zone and blurry. And I do believe that we really need to look at this contextually. For example, in the MENA region, part of the country that it's part of our uh, uh, research programs, we also have the issue of temporary marriages, which in reality, it is a form of sanctioned transactional sex. So I think we also really need to, to see at what are the practices in different settings that even are acceptable, but in reality have implications in terms of sexual and reproductive health, agency, vulnerability, and all of those aspects. So I do believe that a broader lens, but more a contextual setting uh, would be welcome. And really just understanding, I think we just have so little evidence around what what people do, how they do that, with whom, where, how, how long, uh, you know, what are the implications, what are the perceptions about themselves, what are other people's perception about them, just to really understand how to navigate this field. But uh, Jane might have more um, sophisticated advice. <laughs> well, I don't have anything more sophisticated. I think I wanted to reinforce what you said about the, the context and the, you know, and that really uh, we're looking at this kind of whole continuum of practices and I think Shichi you're right you know we're all engaged in some level of uh, transaction and going back to the really early feminist work on that who you know marriage is a transaction in um, you know as well but I think the context and the the and I think looking at this kind of transactional or sexual exchange but also more broadly looking at why people who are displaced or who are forced migrants or arrive in situations of vulnerability or insecurity where their choice is in some way limited. I mean, we see that there is agency in, in decisions, but also, I mean, I'm working in the context of Europe, for example, where we can make a clear contextual link between migration policies and very restrictive migration policies and the fact that um, people, A, can't cross borders without engaging in some kind of sexual exchange, or they need to do it for protection on the way, or they have to do it to get money to feed themselves. So, I mean, I think, yeah, that contextual. And so rather than focusing on just women or men or trans people, or but to see, you know, what are the context? What is this legal and political and economic context? And how does it create situations where individuals engage in in all of these different kinds um, of sexual exchange and what it means to them and how also clearly how that has a, a big impact on their their sexual and reproductive health um, and certainly it does and I think one of the things that we've been really thinking about is how because this question because people don't really know how to talk about it or they don't want to talk about it or they want to ignore it then it really has implications for access and for the services that are open um, to, to migrants and, and refugees and people of displaced people um, in those circumstances. So I don't know if that was any clearer. Or that I just don't think to what Shirin said, but I'll just said the same thing again. But anyway. Um, if I may add just to what Shirin said, I mean, you, you spoke about the development context being different and separate, but I'm actually wondering, is it so different and separate? And should we maybe not be actually looking to that? Because you know, we talk about context, but you're looking specifically at the context of displacements, but where, what is the context that uh, migrants and refugees have come from? And I mean, um, uh, Jane and I are doing this work in Eastern and Southern Africa, where we, we have included uh, young people who identify as sex workers and young people who don't identify as sex workers. And you really just, the, 
you can't this this just we argue the same as you there is no difference um and there are the same repercussions for poor srh um, and we too are making this case for why do we have these binaries when they're they're not helpful in supporting the srh uh, in particular of these young women but i think um maybe there is something to be learned through the development context in in in, in providing explanation um looking into space settings no, I think that's definitely a valid point, I mean, I think, you know, and you, you're right that, you know, when you're looking at the context of the, the, the practice, then you can look at even, you know, the development versus displacement context, that's also a contextual kind of aspects of it. But I think what really puts uh, the transactional sex in forced displacement aside is that it's quite much and strongly influenced by migration policies, by migration status, by your rights to services, which as a citizen, you have kind of the same right as everybody else, but as a refugee, you're actually stripped of a lot of your rights. And I think that lack of uh, social network, lack of you know, financial support that you might have in your own setting in a development context is quite substantially different uh, in a refugee setting. And I think that's why when we were looking at, again, the literature from on transactional sex, we just had really difficulties to see that that exact uh, kind of conceptualization can apply to that setting. But yeah, actually, I think it is timely for us to kind of challenge the maybe the conventional transactional sex paradigm and look at it from a broader and a more diffuse perspective that there is actually the boundaries between sex work and transactional sex and sometimes even with sexual exploitation is very blurry. Indeed. And issues of food insecurity, uh, they are common across the, the spectrums. You know, I, I, I totally appreciate that policies and guidelines do shape vulnerability, but they also, um, I think there's a lot that can be learned about the common fundamental uh, survival based needs. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there, there has been historically perhaps also a more pragmatic reason for the distinguish, distinguishing transactional sex from sex work, partly because sex work has been much more stigmatizing, but also going back to the US policies where a lot of organizations working on sex work were denied those funding. So that was maybe a more strategic way to kind of package it in order to get funding. So I think there has been also some more reasons beyond that, this, you know, separation, but, you know, we definitely need to be revisit it. There's a lot to think about on that topic, you know, because again, we're all transacting all the time, not necessarily with our bodies, but, you know, perhaps sometimes. And um, what does it mean to be transactional when you leave the sex out? And then what is it that makes the sex need to come in. You know what I mean? It's sort of like understanding us as transactional beings or our societies as transactional societies, first of all. Um, in what ways do we transact? Let's forget about sex. And then once we understand that, then, you know, what is it that, you know, opens the door for it to become sexual? I think lots of things and lots of questions one could pose, I think, there. So a lot to do. Yeah, thank you. Good thought exercise. <laughs> yeah, very good thought exercise and lots of questions. Um, does anyone else in the audio, our audience, uh, I hope you're all still there. So if you would, if, if anyone else has any questions that they would like to put to any of the uh, panelists, please do go ahead. Uh, I think anyone wants to. I have a question, Jane. Yeah, Tamarin, go If ahead. I may. So I, I found to myself, I mean, it was Margaret's presentation that um, she had underneath the abortion um, data was contraceptive data. And it was interesting that the contraceptive services there was uh, were higher in those with mildly restrictive settings versus those contexts that had highly restrictive um, abortion policy settings. And then I started thinking about um, telemedicine for contraception, contraceptive use um, and wondering um, you know, how, how successful that may be or how, I think you know, the, the other side of the coin to um, abortion issues is 
actually providing women with contraception should they wish it. And I think we often miss that out um, in, in these discussions. So, you know, Mario or Chichi, you both have this reproductive, strongly reproductive health backgrounds. Um, are there any um, interventions with uh, telemedicine and contraceptive use amongst um, in displaced settings? Or is it not an issue? Not that I'm aware of, honestly. Um, I, I wouldn't want to say a, a straight no, but um, not that I'm aware of. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, if they do exist, um, uh, I'm not sure that they are widespread, I think because of all the challenges that we've already talked about, you know, um, on this call, but I, I don't know for sure. Um, I know there are other kinds of, you know, tele, you know, interventions um, for other SRHR related type things. Um, contraception in particular, I just really don't know. And um, we recently worked with UNHCR our regional office here in Nairobi to put together a compendium of interventions um, that have been, that are regarded as innovative and so on and so forth, both during COVID and, and uh, pre-COVID. And uh, I don't recall um, anything like that in particular. I would be surprised if MSI or IRC are not have not expanded some of their telehealth interventions, either whether they're by mobile app or web um, digital chatbots. MSI does not have a chatbot, but um, into humanitarian and some conflict affected populations. But I don't know specifically. I think your question is interesting about contraception and abortion, Tamron. But I mean, people have so many more options for accessing contraception than they do for accessing abortion. And the problem with abortion, which we're now recently a hurdle, a huge hurdle we're starting to get over is that it's been so medicalized, even the unnecessarily medicalized, that it's very exciting to, for those of us to see that maybe it doesn't have to be this medicalized. Maybe this is something that, a paradigm that we have been pushing on people for decades that now doesn't have to. And we sort of got over that in the past, I think several decades with um, contraceptive methods through social marketing, through information provision, pharmacy provision that has been proven pretty reliable and that most people like having a variety of options where they don't just have to go to a health facility to get contraceptives. So I think that's the difference. And there's just lots and lots of contraceptive information out there uh, in so many different channels because it isn't stigmatized. And you don't have to say, this is abortion and worry about confidentiality and privacy of people who might access that information. So I, th I think you're question is fair, but also maybe not the same sort of playing field that we're dealing with. Oh, fair enough. Might uh, those kind of, because yeah, contraception is much more available, but there are certain groups like, for example, younger, younger women who are under 18 or who might, you know, still not be able to go to the, those regular channels, they could still be, um, would there be, would that be a useful intervention to try and, you know, do more remote or telemedicine to help give information or, you know, get contraception? Because perhaps there still is, are still our gaps, like there, it is more widely available, but there some, still seem to be some people who may not be able to access it. Absolutely. And, and there are a lot of peer education programs and social marketing programs um, targeting adolescents. And you can see even the difference in uh, cyanopress and the research related to cyanopress. And they're already introducing cyanopress as a injectable contraceptive that is, is self provided self a person can do it themselves at home. And it's already being tested in many humanitarian settings. But misoprostol, not quite having the same success story. <laughs> so the answer would be to demedicalize abortion and also 
I mean, there's also the whole political issues around it, as you said, like the less access acceptability in in terms of having telemedicine. But how how can then you know what are the strategies? Just more lobbying, more explaining that abortion is a you know access to abortion is uh, a right and should be available or. More, more accurate information, more provision, more access to drugs, more affordable access to drugs and medications. I think all of those things have to happen. Free access to drugs and medications, um, safe provision in a wider variety of channels, including through peers. We have great documented evidence that um, we can assist people with their abortions with very low level, less skilled um, community health workers, like in Bangladesh and in Nepal and other places. And we need to continue to expand and push the the number of community intermediaries and also the, the method for um, provision. You could have uh, advanced provision of, of abortion drugs. There are, you could have commercial sales agents just putting it together with contraceptive information and contraceptive commodities. Can I ask a question, Jane? So I want to come back to Tamar to something that you, you know, a statement you made, and it kept me wondering what I think about it, and I'm not so sure where I stand actually. But you mentioned about the, the work that you're doing, doing to try to engage men in reproductive decision making. And I was just curious to know, um, specifically with regard to decisions around abortion, have, have that been part of your research and what was the outcome and results? Does it help? Because I think where my reluctance is, is does that kind of create more barriers for women to kind of make decisions over their own bodies or does that facilitate by kind of making men more aware about their rights or so? Yeah, just leaving it open there to see what you think. I have the same reservations and the same questions. Shireen, I, I don't know. Um, we have in Latin America, a project called the Masculinities Project, which is really focused on masculinity and a different idea and conceptualization of masculinity um, and involvement in sexual and reproductive health. But I too have concerns. There uh, many um, people use a contraception covertly, they use abortion covertly, and they usually have good reasons. We also have good research in Bangladesh that is it now expanding to humanitarian setting in Kenya and Uganda, I think, and Bangladesh on reproductive coercion and the involvement of partners in coercive decision making. In Bangladesh is the first time I personally have been involved in a project like this that came out of user-centered design experiments with IDEO.org. And it's a place where women are really very isolated and um, not moving out of the house very much and where men really do I was convinced anyway, and I think the partners and the people on the team were convinced that men really did help hold a lot of, of, of uh, persuasive power over women and girls agency, and where the experience in Myanmar was really pretty severe isolation from sexual and reproductive health information. So all that culminated in us looking at adolescent sexual and reproductive health and, and decisions about women actually going to a health facility, which was where it was only provided to access abortion care or contraception and feeling like we needed to involve men and in actually imams <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, in, in those kinds of decisions and those kinds of, at least those kinds of discussions. Well, I guess as everything as an SRA it needs to be contextual and also pragmatic sometimes. Right? Yeah. And it, it, so it was very contextualized and it was, it was a small study um, and I would love to evaluate it fairly, further more intensively, but um, um, it seemed successful to us and we did uh, certainly have more engagement. And we had all, already at the beginning of that influx, there was already a lot of acceptance of sexual and reproductive health information and contraception. And uh, it grew very quickly anyway. So it's hard to disentangle all of the 
all of the effects on that. Yeah, looking forward to read more about it. Yeah, right after I read your papers first. Okay, that's uh, it's really interesting. It's interesting to know when that when that works and how and in what context. Um, and you know, perhaps it does bring everything back to the, this importance of contextualization and and we can't just talk about general humanitarian context or refugee context because they are all in a way there is parallels but in a way they're very specific and things like whether to involve men or or not or all of those things clearly could be uh, very very different okay um audience you have your last chance to ask um questions if you want to so please don't be shy to type your questions in the chat um if not i do any of the other panelists have do any of you have any other questions you want to ask to each other or any other remarks that you'd like to to make about what's been said maybe i have a question for chi chi and this is kind of related to something you touched on a little bit, but I know your work more broadly and I'm curious, I'm always curious to hear what you think about this topic. Uh, it's related to the provision of abortion care for survivors of sexual violence in humanitarian settings. We have a huge disconnect and also a big evidence gap in that area. And I know you've done some work um, at a national level and. I'm just wondering if you have thoughts about what we might do to raise attention, to change protocols, to um, grow visibility and momentum around that issue. And I hope I'm not not putting you on the spot too badly. No, no, not at all. Thanks for the question. Um, I wouldn't say it was on a national level, actually. Um, so we have done some studies personally in um, Uganda, for instance, in uh, selected refugee settings. Um, and uh, one of the things I think um, that could be done is Chi, we've lost you. Maybe you stop your video. Yeah. I think she's oh, there she is. She's yeah. Back. I think you need to put your microphone on, Chi Chi. Your your uh, your mic. Can you put your mic on? I said um, I apologize. I just, I just seem to be having internet bandwidth and electricity issues, so I keep um, uh, dropping off. But uh, I was going back to what I was saying. I think the point that I was trying to make is that, um, you know, sometimes I, I find that with policymakers and, you know, the way in which policies get developed anyway, sometimes, as you know, it's, you know, it's a little bit of luck. Um, and it, sometimes it's just that one, one statistic or two um, that really captures people, people's attentions, attention. And with the work that we've done um, in a few settings, such as Uganda, um, just trying to, you know, understand the experiences of uh, survivors of uh, uh, sexual violence. Um, we, um, uh, the statistics were really high, almost 60%, let's say, among those who um, mentioned, you know, that they had uh, gotten a, a pregnant as a result of, of rape um in a particular uh settlement i think things such as that you know in my my work in other areas whether it's education or whatnot sometimes it's just that one statistic that policymakers need to hear that make them begin to um do something about it whether it has to do with you know changing policies to meet the needs of those concerned um or to um improve programming um so i would say sometimes the shock factor um, is, is what we can use to sort of push the needle a little bit. And it's unfortunate that, you know, it has to be that way, that it has to be that shocking in order to, to get attention. Um, 
But, you know, in addition, I, I would say, again, it goes back to the issue of um, just having enough time to do what needs to be done. Um, because, you know, that the study I'm talking about right now was, um, it was actually sort of like an 18 month uh, project. Um, and then, so what happens after that? You sort of move on to the next thing, even though you have this important data, but you just don't have the time or the bandwidth to, to work some more on the policy aspect of things, you know, which I know we all, you know, face those struggles. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. I hope that answers your question somewhat, uh, Tam Tamara. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, those are excellent points. Thank you, Gigi. And I think that's something we all face to do a study and then have all that data. Uh, I will turn off my video just because of bandwidth issues, if you don't mind. Yeah, please do. So, but I was just saying, I think that's a really, you know, you made some very uh, key points there. Um, if there are no other questions, I think we're coming towards the end of the, I don't know if anyone perhaps wants to make some closing remarks. Um, to sum up or to have a, a few last words, perhaps you could each um, have a minute or so just to give a few last thoughts before we close. On the way forward, what's the most important thing for you in this field at the moment? I can give Shireen and Chichi a little time to think since I've been thinking about this a little bit. Um, um, I think I made a comment about abortion self-care being a, a strong and important way forward, but it also poses some challenges. And when Chichi was just speaking about the one statistic um, that is persuasive, it made me think that we will now be changing the way we look at, at abortions from talking about the percent of women or women people who have unsafe abortions to people who have failed attempts at at causing their own abortions and so unsafe abortion has been over the many decades of abortion research has been that statistic has been that key that has given us that shock factor that is persuasive for policymakers often and we spent a great deal of our resources and energy in trying to figure out more about them. And so while I am excited about mostly about the promise and potential for people to be able to cr control their own fertility, I'm also worried and interested as a researcher about what that takes out of our toolbox. So that's my one thought. That's a very a big thing to think about. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Shirin or Chichi, do you have any last thoughts or thoughts to take us forward for where do we go now? What's important? I don't know, Chichi, you want to go first? Okay, I can go. Um, I think these kind of um, avenues to have really these frank discussions and also kind of really forge collaborations will be very helpful specifically at a time when there is quite much of a kind of backlash on you know both gender and sexual and reproductive health i think is definitely needed and there is also a huge um again additional restrictions around migrants and refugee health which i think you know makes the field of people working in sexual and reproductive health in that specific group is even smaller than the sexual and reproductive health field as such. So I think greater collaboration, uh, you know, increased advocacy to making sure that we can keep up the issues on the agenda of both policymakers and research funding agencies. Um, and it's really exciting to see all these new initiatives and how we can use the technology to provide better services for everyone, including safe abortion care. So, um, well, slightly optimistic, but still cautious. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Chi Chi, I don't know if you can connect, if you can, if we can't see you, can um, we hear you? I can see, yes, I'm so sorry about the issues I'm having. I'm glad it's happening toward the end and not the beginning, but uh, maybe I could say, um, I guess Shirin, Shirin took the, the words out of my mouth. I really wanted to just focus on the need for strategic collaborations and partnerships. We're all doing you know, wonderful work in our own little corners. This can be a very lonely uh, field in some ways. I guess not because there are not enough, enough of us, but because 
probably partly because we're also really busy and sort of just laser focused in our own little corner and don't realize how much com commonality there is between our work, our, our challenges, um, our successes, you know, our thinking about innovation. I think there needs to be, you know, a much tighter, I think, network um, of people doing this work. Yeah, there are a million networks out there, but I think, you know, there needs to be a much tighter one on research that is focused on the kinds of settings that um, you know, we're here to talk about today. Um, I guess that would mean I, my take a, take away message. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you really, everyone, all the panelists have given us uh, really a lot of things to think about and take forward. And I really hope, um, I think I'm speaking for Tamarin too, but I'll let you <laughs> join in as well and say, say what you think, Tamarin. But I think that would be really, you know, a key thing and something we hope that will come out of this is to be able to move forward and to network and to connect um, and not to all be working in our own little corner because there, you know, there are lots of things to do in as what um, I think perhaps I have the, um, I often see the pessimistic side of just the restrictions and the, uh, the control of migrations and refugees and, and forced displacement. But perhaps there are some also positive and you know, the fact that we're talking about this, that there are these new possibilities and opening up and new initiatives, that's also um, perhaps some guarded optimism is also called for. So I just want to thank again um, Tamara, Chichi, and Shirin, and Margit, who um, unfortunately had to leave us, but uh, her participation was great as well. So thank you all very much. And I'll hand over to Tamarin for her last word. I'm slowly disappearing off the screen. It's winter in South Africa. It's getting dark. <laughs> Um, no, I think uh, just to just to echo uh, Jane, just say thank you very much. I mean, it's been in, uh, really interesting and engaging, and I, I know my head is got hundreds of ideas, and I'd actually like to take up a whole bunch of discussions offline with with different colleagues on on different issues. And I think um, also just to echo Chi Chi is that uh, we, I think we've got a lot to learn from one another and across disciplines as well. Um, I think there's there's been a, a lot of work being done that we can potentially springboard from and and move forward on rather than I think someone talked about reinvent you know don't want to reinvent the wheel but I I think um, I think it's quite exciting that you know that we need to tap into these um, partnerships and and learn on, on other work so thank you Jane I think uh, Luciano wanted to. You yes, uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Jane and Tamarin, for sharing so well this panel. Very interesting. Thank you very much to all the speakers, you know, for a really interesting presentations and then discussion. I would like to thank very much all the participants for having been online with us two hours today, and of course, the Made Alliance, and especially Nora Anton and her team, always very efficient. So, looking forward to other events like this. This series will continue. Uh, in September, on the 7th of September, we will have another very interesting webinar uh, on education. I mean, how to integrate education on this topic in medicine and other health professions. And this will be, uh, I think, it's a very interesting topic. You know, in this series, we try always to to uh, address, uh, uh, you know, the, this uh, important theme of uh, migrant or refugee health from different uh, points of view. And again, we will uh, we will continue. Also, a uh, final thought uh, goes to the World Refugee Day that uh, will happen in two days on the 20th of June. So I hope really that the situation all over the world will do well for all of these people I know with so many problems. So uh, thanks again to everyone and looking forward to seeing you again online on the M8 Alliance screen. Thanks. <laughs>